All right, Louise Valentine, you are here in Dr. D's Social Network. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Well, you know what's great is uh, you and I will be sharing a stage in February at ACSM IDEA and a panel of some sort. <laughs> Come yes, on. it's going to be a Fit Pro Perspectives, I believe. Perspectives. Well, okay, I'm curious about this. Perspectives in what way do you think we're going to be chatting about? So, you know, a lot of times we are honestly there to answer questions and the conversation just gets started based on what's on the audience's mind and just hearing, you know, our career experience and our lessons learned, what we've done as fitness professionals. And a lot of times there's a few prompting questions, but it's really about what's the audience there to learn about and what do they yeah. need to know? Right. So I guess that brings me to maybe what's on your mind about health, fitness, and wellness these days? What have you been maybe charged up about or chatting about quite a bit? Yeah, honestly, I love my zone of genius, which is perimenopausal health and fitness, specifically for women runners. So as a woman who's had many hormonal challenges, just looking at how do we maintain this fit and active lifestyle when we have women's health challenges? So I'm, I'm just loving some of the female specific science that's coming out. Um, I've really enjoyed entrepreneurship and just kind of running with cutting edge science and applying it with my clients, which I know you love to do as well. I do. I really love. Um, but I think um, this perimenopausal topic is right on time. I've actually had several um, people subscribe to the podcast, ask me to talk to someone <laughs> related to this. So I'm like... All right, this is good timing here. So let's just dive in. Like, what are some of the challenges women are chasing or are facing hormonally? Just kind of break that down initially, and then we'll talk a little bit about the science behind it. You know? Yeah. Well, what we see is typically around age 35, we see hormones start to shift in women. Uh, significant decreases in estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone which as we know, impact almost every aspect of a woman's well-being, fitness, and performance. So we have to really stop to reconsider how our body is changing and shift both you know, nutrition, lifestyle habits, and fitness strategy to accommodate. Right. Most, most definitely. So we dive even deeper into specific, besides that, like what are those changes that occur that affect performance? primarily with those changes in hormone? Yeah. Well, if we're looking at day-to-day -day nutrition, mm -hmm. it becomes really important to get daily protein needs met to ensure we're having high quality of protein around our fitness sessions. And I say that, you know, a lot of times in maybe in our twenties, we could get away with, you know, applying these weird fad diets or under fueling but now that is so counterproductive. It's harder for our body to use food as fuel and to see results from fitness. So it's essential, this mindset shift that our fitness needs fuel. So yeah. fueling before and after, it would become very counterproductive to restrict, especially around the exercise session. Let's talk about under fueling. I don't think this is talked about enough in terms of this. Tell us a little bit about what that means. Um, I think for the audience, it's important for them to understand what does that mean? Because maybe like under fueling, I mean, people are over fueling all the time. <laughs> like, yes. Talk about under fueling related to performance relate for that. Oh my goodness. Yes. It, it can absolutely break our success. But I think what's even more important is how we see this show up in day-to-day -day life. You know, for women, it's incredibly low energy, fatigue, weight gain, despite eating well, and it can be very frustrating when you're working out incredibly hard, dedicated to your fitness and nutrition and not seeing results or seeing these counterproductive results. So it is really ensuring that you're fueling before and after the exercise session, as well as eating enough throughout the day. I know so many high achieving, wonderful women, even my colleagues in sports medicine, they just go, go, go all day long and they don't have time, you know, air quotes to eat <laughs> or the, you know, working in something like healthcare, you know, we really do see patient after patient sometime, but it's that intentional. Can you keep, you know, some nuts and an apple in your office for a snack? Can you advocate for yourself to have a little bit of a lunchtime? 
by law, you need one anyways, but it's time to speak up because it's going to make or break your success here in both your day-to-day life and performance. Now, do you see this primarily in maybe your your very high achieving, um, ambitious fitness based folks, or how does this relate to kind of your, I'll say general population folks who are struggling to exercise regularly? Yes. And I, you know, it's interesting when I even think of someone like my mom, she is pretty much sedentary. She recently got into some lifestyle walking, which I'm very proud of her for, but even, you know, with her, she's thinking, you know, low fat, she's thinking, you know, some of these older dietary, um, lifestyle habits that from the past, maybe like the low, the low fat and extremely low calorie. And, you know, even then it's talking about, Hey mom, you need to eat more. Your body needs nourishment. Your hormones need nourishment. You get energy from food. It's not a bad thing to have multiple meals per day. It's actually going to help you lose weight. <laughs> so talk about maybe this socialization that has occurred from the past to the present in terms of nourishing your body. Yeah. You know, sometimes we, I think language, you know, matters in context of the individual. So we do have those who tend to um, overeat calories. And sometimes I see that said as overnourished. When I think that we, you know, the powerful language shift there is it's over fed perhaps, Mm. but that person, if they're eating poor quality food, they're still missing so many beautiful micronutrients and high quality ingredients from that you get from whole foods versus, you know, the lesser empowering choices, if you will. Sure, sure. Why do you think that nutrition is so uh, difficult? sometimes I have discussions with people about versus let's say something, I mean, it can be difficult too talking about sleep or stress management or positive relationships. What's the, what's the difficulty in nutrition, especially with those conversations? I think we see, you know, it, I think it's funny that it's the one area of life where you see people almost take like a religious stance. They're so over the top about their beliefs and I think we just need to remember what works for one doesn't work for another. And then there's also a lot of wild misinformation out there. <laughs> yeah. M- misleading spins on Crazy research. <laughs> oh, you know, I just, I use the example of like, you see the perfect pre-workout meal and you run with it. You're like, oh, I'm going to eat this every day. Did you look to see the context of the research study where that media article pulled it from? It was for, you know, pro wrestlers and you're a female endurance runner who's in her fifties and menopausal. That doesn't apply. <laughs> like those two don't mix. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think there's a there's almost a interesting identity based formation that happens with nutrition. Like if someone is a carnivore or a vegan or they're keto, like they identify their existence as that. And yeah. then it's it's hard to have a very nuanced conversation if someone just believes they're right completely. Like there's no other way. I think nutrition lends itself to that many times. People build their communities around their nutritional identity many times. Yeah. And I think as a fitness professional, we just have to be sensitive to that. And a lot of times, even if I have someone who's so um, opposite of what I would have recommended, I'm still going to approach it with an open mind, hear them, you know, take the time to listen to their why, and then continue to sprinkle in the education and let them know when they feel stuck, you know, kind of taking it back to that pain point, like, okay, so let's look at, you know, the nutrition piece that's contributing to this staying stuck and what you can do about it to shift it in the opposite direction. Sometimes it's months in a coaching relationship before you have that opportunity to (laughs) turn it around, but it's just patience. Yeah. What's the most difficult thing with misinformation or just strange things you're seeing out there, like, and helping people, what's the hardest part? I, if I'm being honest, I think social media right now is just running rampant with misinformation with, you know, we have really great information about female specific science, but I think it's going way overboard in someone getting some people getting a little bit of information, creating whole programs and I, I see so many women struggling with just knowing where to even start which Mm. I just, it's, it's frustrating. And as a, you know, ACSM practitioner of the year, someone who is a leading expert, 
it's like, I get lost in social media and I'm sitting there like, wait, knock, knock, knock. I a little bit know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. It's like, are you listening guys? I don't have abs that are flashing in front of your face. <laughs> now. I'm so sorry. Like, <laughs> It's a difficult thing. It's, um, fighting the wave of, I kind of have two things about this, but it's like, there's a marketing aspect that is very effective. Even if you don't agree with it, which I don't most of the time, it's very effective marketing. And it's marketing that often people like yourself or myself in the positions we're in, we're, we're not doing that type of marketing. Because maybe, well, at least for me, is I just, I just don't want to do that type of stuff, you know? But how do you get people to want to listen to people who are uh, accomplished or sane? <laughs> like, you are know. not trying to take advantage of you versus just the shiny toy thing that you see online for people, you know? Yeah. And it's, you know, I think podcasting is a great place. Like I recently made a huge shift. I've been doing social media videos here and there. I have mm -hmm. my blog on my website, but, you know, starting my own podcast because I'm sitting there thinking is an industry leading expert. What does that accolade mean if I'm not yeah. sharing knowledge with the world? And doing it in a way where you're not getting lost in an algorithm yeah. or you're talking to the same 2000 people that follow you. And it's just, it's frustrating. So I think that deeper context and deeper conversations and us as fitness pros and professionals who are evidence-based coming together and yeah. really just speaking out and doing our very best. I totally agree with that. It's uh, one of the reasons I started a podcast about six years ago in doing it. And uh, I regularly feature my colleagues on here because I think of people listening, you listen to kind of a long form converse conversation, you're going to start really ingesting and taking that in. Mm -hmm. While it may be popular to do shorts and stuff like that, you're not really understanding what that person's really idea is about. It's just a short grab your attention thing for that. But if we want to do better, we have to actually unite together and help each like we have to feature each other. Yes, we really do. We really have to spend time knowing who each other is and then featuring each other and and have these because that's what other folks are doing. They're just out there pumping information constantly, good or bad. They're just like you're just blitzing <laughs> the market with information. We got to start blitzing the market. Yep. I know. And that's that's part of the reason why I am on social media as much as I say that I post and I run, like I don't interact. I don't want to scroll it, Yeah. but it's just, you know, standing there tall and saying like, look guys, it's much more simple than you think. And let's talk about the science and the way your body actually works. And here's a nugget of an action step you can apply today. And yeah. you know, that trying to be the sanity throughout the chaos. Yeah. All right. Here's a question. What do you think we're doing right as professionals in this business to help people? And what do you think we're not doing so well to help hmm. other people? I think that being evidence-based, but not evidence-limited is a superpower. So I see a lot of practitioners sharing, you know, this is the guideline or best practice, but let's talk about how it fits specific to you. And I'd say that was one of the resounding messages that just kept floating to the top of Summit last year, ACSM Summit, and now coming together with IDEA is talking about how to be a compassionate fitness professional, meeting the client where they're at in their journey, and then you expedite their success. It's not pretending like we're the expert who knows everything and shoving you know, all the information down their throat. It's more so here's your journey and how we design it. So I love that. I love that we can use that lens as fitness professionals to meet the client where they're at. Right. And on the other side, well, I mean, where can we improve upon? Like, really, you think we need to make this next step to really launch it forward and what we're doing? I, I love the idea of outside the box thinking and innovation. And a lot of times, especially as a female, I have held myself back earlier in my career. Mm -hmm. And I am younger with many accolades now, but part of that was just having the courage to realize that you don't have to reach a certain point in your career to be innovative, to have a solution, to be an expert, to win an award. So I'd like to actually see more innovation in undergraduate, you know, exercise science classes, coming together with staff and mentorship, 
um, thinking, you know, with this entrepreneurship lens of innovation. And I think that would be really cool to, to grow as a fitness professional, you know, not just necessarily as a trainer or a group exercise instructor, yeah. but how can you take that and, you know, run with it in your own niche and own innovation. So what specific innovation, like let's dive deep, deeper into that. Do you think would be a, a good kind of like launching pad to be more, how could be be more innovative? I think it's just looking for what do you enjoy doing? It like creating this career in life that you love. Who do you love to serve? Yeah. Maybe you came as a fitness professional from a background of struggling with obesity. You can really relate with obese clients and empower them to feel their best. So maybe that's your zone of genius. Yeah. I wish that, I think that examining this, where do you love to serve in the fitness industry? Mm -hmm. And where do you have expertise or can you develop expertise so that you enjoy your career and then serve at your highest level? That's awesome. You know what? I was just thinking about this today. I was driving my daughter to school and I started thinking about, this was actually about football, <laughs> but, it, but yeah. often like we end up, and this is an analogy for football, but like you might take an offensive coordinator and make them the head coach, which is the CEO position of the job in NFL or college. But maybe that person should continue to be an offensive coordinator and not be a head coach. And I think we do this in fitness where a lot of fitness professionals maybe start in one place and then they maybe aspire to get, you know, obviously a regular paycheck. And then they move into some executive role or management role that they actually don't love, but they're doing it for the financial aspect of it. And I think we need to have more pathways for people to be in the business long term, but also not sacrifice themselves for something that they really just don't like doing for yes. that. And I think some more innovation and different opportunities, but not just saying, hey, there is no there's no shame, zero shame in being a lifelong trainer or a group exercise instructor. There should be no shame about that. You're amazing. You're doing yeah. that. And but you don't, you're not required to move up, move mm -hmm. up in quotations. Yeah. Do something else. Like do what you enjoy. Do that and be mm -hmm. great at that. Don't, don't sacrifice that power for something else you think will give you power. Yeah, definitely. And it's also too when the pay doesn't match, like your desired income, mm -hmm. how can you take what you've learned and run with it? and do something on your own. Yeah. You know, sometimes that is scary to leap and yeah. take the entrepreneurship leap and it's never going to work out as fast as you want it to, no. I think is the takeaway from what I've learned. Never. But it does if you're consistent with it. It's it's just it's incredible and if you stay passionate and impact do your best to learn, you know, the business yeah. side of things, it's really it is so very possible for for anyone, especially if you if you're not happy. I use yeah. um, the career reference that I have LeBron James a lot of my past positions, <laughs> meaning I took my, I took my talents elsewhere because it was just, <laughs> it was just, an, yeah, it was just an environment that, you know, I was told, like I came up with an entire program one time yeah. and I was told that I was just, I had, I needed to have five years in the business before I could speak up in meetings. And I was oh. just like. I, I don't accept that. The hell? And, you know, I, I know <laughs> I stuck around for a little bit, but I was like, am I really going to wait five years to have a voice? I don't think I am. So I took my talents elsewhere. LeBron James did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy, by the way. Uh, speak up. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting that, you know, we don't teach entrepreneurship to our fitness, our upcoming fitness professionals and their educational uh, aspect, you know, whether it's traditional four-year career college. We don't teach it. So then we yeah. push people out and they have no clue how to become their own, you know, their own business owners for that. Yeah. And I'm actually interested in seeing, and I'm pumped about this ACSM idea uh, deal. We need to spend more time on that. We need to help people become better entrepreneurs. And I also think, speaking of innovation, I just think conferences should be better than what they are currently. I mean, I just speak out about this stuff all the time. Like people come <laughs> to these things to meet other people, yeah. you know, and, and the lectures are fine and stuff, but it's like, eh, how can we, how can we get people together more often during these conferences? 
Well, let's be more innovative than what we currently do. A lot of times I come through the door, whatever conference I go to, you know, it's a registration center. whoop de doo You know, there's no energy. There's no excitement. Like, where's someone at the door greeting me? Or all the people coming through? Bring the energy. Cr create collisions with people to come together. Because what I noticed, especially at uh, IDEA this past summer, IDEA is great. And, uh, you know, but these, everybody from IDEA, you're going to hear this. You know how I am. I talk about this stuff. I'm like, we got to do better in mentoring people in our business. And we have these conferences. We have got to get people together or else. I see a lot of Fit Bros at conferences on their phone looking down all the time in a corner. You got to get rid of that. We have to get rid of that. that that's my opinion on it. Yeah. And I think what I think, though, is like, especially the last ACSM Summit, we did shift things a lot in terms of here is a lecture and then here's a panel. Yeah. So you get to ask questions or, mm -hmm. hey, the three lecturers that were just presented are now st you can stand in line and talk to them. Yeah. And for me, it was a wild experience to be able to go up and talk to leading experts, yeah. you know, that sit on like the dietetics committee of the Olympics. It was like, yeah. I could ask him a question about my own practice to see, am I using the best science? Like yeah. I was able to run my business strategies and nutrition and performance by these experts. And it was just, yeah. you know, it was collaboration, but it's like, when are you ever in a room with individuals like that and just brainstorming? And so I felt that crazy contagious energy and, you know, went to dinner afterwards with people that I met and just brainstormed about fitness entrepreneurship. And it was, yeah. it was the best. So I think this next, you know, come in February yeah. guys, cause it's going to be fun. Come in February. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> I think one of the other things too, is um, we got to make this more affordable for our colleagues to show up as well. I think conferences yeah. are way too expensive for, I mean, a lot of my colleagues, I know they never come to this stuff because it's, it's, it's cost prohibitive. A lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I want to see, I love this collaboration we're doing. I, I always push the people I work with. I'm like, listen, what, what can we do more? Like a lot of the people in our business don't attend this stuff because they just can't afford to miss work. So Very we true. have to be more, we have to do a better job figuring out a way to get more people to these, even if it means we have less speakers at conferences and stuff, whatever it is, we got to help more scholarships, whatever it is, we got to help our colleagues be able to get to these things to experience a lot of the joy that we experience going on these things. Yeah. And I think that's so true when we're just even looking at like the average salaries and pay yeah. for exercise professionals, it doesn't meet our expertise in any way. And I know we're really working hard at ACSM yeah. and I'm sure idea is as mm -hmm. well to, to shift that, to have, you know, the healthcare industry recognize exercise as medicine as an example, yeah. but you know, until we get there, there is that very, you know, cold, hard truth that you look at the personal training salary and you, some people are making like $20 an hour. Right. It's like what you can make more at Amazon. Like that's right. not okay. That's you not come okay. To a conference and fly and lodge and, <laughs> yeah. you know, eat, you know, all your meals plus the conference registration. Uh, there's just, you know, I think we're doing better, but you know, again, in anything you want to continue to improve and grow. And uh, we, we have some ways to go. But I actually think that speaking of this conference, because um, I know a part of this, too, is we, we really want to pump up this conference is really awesome, because to my knowledge, it's one of the first collaborations like this, because, you know, mainly it's kind of like it's a lot of siloing these conferences. It's like the yeah. ACS. I was at the ACSM conference in May. I was on a panel. There was great. But then you can go to NSCA or you go to IDEA or URSA and they're just everybody's just kind of on their own. And I love, big shout out to Amy Thompson, CEO of Idea, and when I, and the committee work I do for them. They were she was talking about this collaboration. I said well, I want to see more of this because you know we at the Idea conference in the summer world was at the same date as the NSCA conference. That should never happen, ever. We shouldn't wow. be making people choose between one or two. Like, it shouldn't be doing that. Why aren't these organizations all coming together just like ACSM and Idea? are doing. That's my question to folks listening. Yeah. And you know, the, the power of collaboration, you know, this attitude of abundance, like yes. there is so much we can do in the industry together than separate, like together, we're so much more. 
way better. Powerful. We really are. So it, it is putting some ego aside sometimes or, mm-hmm. you know, giving and taking in a relationship, but, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to see how the conference ends up. And like, just the fact more fitness pros to network with is yeah, that's right. really cool. That's right. That's exactly right. And I think that's kind of the spirit of what we're looking at is how do we help our colleagues, ourselves? And this is a great opportunity for that. And panels like this, I think, are important to see. You see people up there, your colleagues who have done well, and you ask them questions. How have you achieved this? Or what are your thoughts about this and that? There's just a lot of power in that. And and more of those things, I think, are really good. I mean, it's, it's great to hear someone talk, uh, lecture about something, but you can almost glaze over those things too, if it's not really that exciting, you know, yeah. think you want to encourage that collaboration and the speaking and the chatting and the questions, um, I think is a really important thing. So I'm, I'm pretty pumped about it actually. Yeah. And I think too, like just the contagious atmosphere, like everyone is so down to earth yeah. and you develop your network. And when you have someone who is incredibly accomplished, tell you, Hey, if you never need anything. And you're like, wow, that's one person who has my back that I just met today. And they're like an idol. Like, this is so cool. Like, I don't, you know, in the different ACSM journals, you might read an article and it's like, you can meet that person. And then, hey, they just said you could write an article. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is snowballing into something amazing. Yeah. You know, I want to, I'm interested. um, Tell me your journey with ACSM, kind of the beginnings and where you're at now with them. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So I had a very crazy undergraduate journey, but ultimately ended up getting my undergrad in exercise science. So I actually got certified as a personal trainer while in undergrad, which I was, you know, our instructors tell us to do that, but not too many people actually did. Mm. But what was so cool is that becoming a personal trainer in undergrad, I not only applied what I learned in real time, but I had so much experience coming out of undergrad that I was confident trainer. I learned what I loved, what I didn't. And I saw many other of my my peers do the same. So as an example, one um, young guy loved training older individuals. And he's like, I really want to go to PT school, but I want to specialize in elderly. And now he's like running with his career. And this is so cool to look like you discovered your passion because you took action in undergrad. So I think that that initial certification really expedited my success, as well as helping me to learn a lot about myself. Uh, Then I became an exercise physiologist, and that certification has been incredible in terms of being able to work in fitness centers, hospital systems, physical therapy, in the NFL, (laughs) um, so many cool different aspects. And now I'm in uh, my own business and really looking at the physiology of the female body, specifically perimenopause and in runners. So I'm a runner and I'm over 35. So perimenopausal, it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> can help when's myself your, and others. Yeah. Yeah. When's your passion for running kick in? When'd you start uh, doing that? Ooh. So I was not built to be a runner. <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was actually cut from my volleyball team junior year. It was my passion. I played it year round and cross country didn't cut. So I'm like, all right, I want to play a sport. I'm going to start running. I was dead last on the team. I was, you know, overweight. I was told I wasn't built to be a runner by my doctors. They're like, no, just stop. And, (laughs) and I said, no, no, like this, like even back then I was feisty. I took a step back and I said, I don't accept that. So I just kept being consistent with my running. Um, Obviously having education helped tremendously learning the physiology of the human body. And here I am, you know, years later and semi-competitive female athlete, I've made competitive running teams, qualified for Boston. So if you're told you're not built to be a runner and you love it, <laughs> ladies, gentlemen, you absolutely can. Yeah. Um, I, I'm i always curious about runners. I, I was a collegiate track and field athlete. And uh, I mean, it was a huge part of my life for a long time. I still enjoy running, um, but I'm always curious when other people enjoy running uh, for that. It was definitely like a job when I was doing it. <laughs> it oh, I like, bet. Oh my gosh. It was a scholarship, man. It was like, you know, this whole student athlete thing is very strange situation because I mean, you're basically working. I mean, you really are. And yes. you don't have a lot of time outside of that. Um, but I mean, anybody could run honestly, and it's not necessarily, you know, winning and having, it's just, it's just a lot of improvement 
And, and running's a skill. It's yes. a definite skill. I wish more people would recognize that. It's not just something you just go out and do. There's a lot of skill development related to running. Um, but man, I, man, I remember running constantly. I mean, constantly. <laughs> it was like, woo, all I know. the time. Most of the yeah. women I coach run constantly for fun or for their mental health. And I'm like, yeah, all right, yeah. I mean, let's take a step back. <laughs> let's take a step back. I know, right? <laughs> it's, it's high just mileage very interesting. Crazy. Uh. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your journey, though, to um, this incredible award that you've recently um, earned. Yes. Uh, I love that um, with ACSM. Uh, you know, it's been such a dynamic journey. And you know, as I mentioned, I got certified at a young age and just continued to grow and develop as a professional. And I did have my dream career right out of undergrad, actually before I graduated um, in my exercise science program, I did get a job with the Cleveland Browns in the NFL yeah. and I loved it. I was working in medical fitness centers and local hospital systems, collaborating with physicians and really had set myself up for success. And then I fell in love with a U.S. soldier and started relocating all throughout the U.S. Mm -hmm. as an army spouse. So moving 12 times in 15 years, yep. it was incredibly hard. I had to be very innovative. And then there's also the fact that there's just a hiring stigma against military spouses because sure. inevitably we relocate. So, you know, even trying to set up my own business in the beginning was very frustrating. Sometimes living somewhere as short as eight months at a time, you acquire five clients and you're it's time to leave. So I ended up going back and getting my master's in public health, really studied a lot of women's health, exercise science there as well, nutrition, and ended up publishing research in a fellowship. So that was a very great follow on, a lot of community um, practicum experience as well. And then took the leap and started my own business when I was struggling with my health as a female runner and started to realize that in reversing my own health with exercise and food as medicine, that, wow, like using my knowledge to help women just like me. And since then it has been incredible just applying cutting edge science and using my knowledge, ACS on best practices, you know, sports and nutrition yeah. best practices and being an innovative leader in the, in the industry. So I think it comes from the dynamic background as well as some community service and just this idea of innovation and impact at a young age, you know, young female in science. Yeah. It's kind of cool. What was it? What did it feel like to win the award? What, what, what did you, what were your thoughts? You know, I always say when I submitted my application packet, it was like, uh, okay, do I qualify for this? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you see sports medicine providers and researchers and wildly credentialed people in academia. And it was like, do I, as an exercise physiologist, fit in? Uh, will my application even be considered? And, you know, for them to recognize innovation and someone who hasn't given up, someone who's done amazing things with the credentials that I do have, you know, it was really, it was really eye opening. And, um, you know, just recognizing a you know, female in science, I think, is really cool to, to recognize that you can be a leader at any age. Yeah, most definitely. Um, and what a great honor. You know, um, I think it's important to like our colleagues to know that, you know, you push yourself and you, as you aspire for excellence and, and you move forward. It's it's possible for many different people to win these types of awards. It's you don't have to be the biggest name in the industry and all that stuff. It's possible yeah. to make your way towards of those things. And I think it's nice that ACSM and IDEA, they're bringing together award winners in a panel to discuss, you know, kind of an open q and That It's just a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we all come from very diverse backgrounds. So I think it's so cool to see what you can do and what is possible yeah. with fitness certifications, because it's not a box. We are so outside the box most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. And, uh, Hopefully, you know, I, I think the time we have there will be great to meet you in person. It's going to be nice. Yes. And uh, Christine Conti, who will be there. I, I met her during our award ceremony thing uh, as well. She was awesome. And it just goes back to that kind of collegial environment. You get to meet different people. 
And now you get this combination of ACSM idea award winners colliding together, having different thoughts and ideas, connecting, um, just getting to know each other. I'm a big proponent of that. I've been that my entire 23 years now in the business, all about meeting people. Always, every week, connect with my colleagues, being as non-siloed as possible. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. I want to meet everyone that does what I do or different stuff that I do within the business. And it's always, um, it's always done me very well in life yeah. to do that, you know, in general, just in life, it's good to meet people. You know, you get older, you, you, people tend to kind of shrink their lives to their family. They're very close friends and you start getting away from that wonder and the awe of meeting other people outside of those environments. Yeah. That's really important. It's just the creative inspiration that yeah. comes from that too. I just, I remember meeting um, a colleague at ACSM and he was in like the business management side of fitness, but then also had just developed a, like gotten a patent for a fitness device. Mm. So I was like, wait, wait a minute. So let's yeah. talk about how you did that and yeah. how is that possible? And, you know, just starting the conversation there was like, wow, people do really cool things. <laughs> yeah. And how will you know that? if you don't push yourself to meet other people. And yeah. I know it's it could be difficult when you're working in your business every day. I mean, you know, when you own your own business, like you do, I do, you're working in your business all the time. It's very difficult to go outside of that, but it's important to do that, to get different ideas, perspectives, you know, and, and unique stuff that you may never even thought of to do. Yeah. Or, What's know. interesting too, is even as a fitness professional, we can influence the researchers and those in academia. So as an example, I was talking to a researcher who looks specifically at exercise for cancer. Mm. And I was sharing with him, he's looking at like minimally effective doses and specific types right. for various types of cancer. And I was sharing in my practice with cancer survivors, oftentimes I have to share to cut back on exercise mm. because I work with highly dedicated endurance athletes. Right. And he was like, Oh my God. Like he put his hand in his hands. He's like, I never thought of exercise in that approach with cancer. Right. He's like, yeah. he's like, that's so cool to keep that in the back of my mind that there's, you know, personality types that are so go, go, go with their endurance right. that yes, that's counterproductive to their <laughs> cancer. <endurance. laughs> so most definitely, I think, you know, kind of this, you think about cancer patients and exercise. Okay. What's the minimal level of dosage to provide sufficient stimulus here. You don't, you don't necessarily think the, oh, wow, this person is an avid runner and they, you know, against <laughs> cancer, they just don't want to stop running. Damn it. They just want to like keep pushing it. You know, it's, yeah, it's often not necessarily the majority of the population, but there's two things could be true with a yes. <laughs> deal, you know? Yeah. But it's so cool for me as like a fitness professional to influence a researcher and like blow his wow. mind. I'm like, wait, I'm normally reading your work and you're blowing my mind. This is so yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you want to see? What's the future of our industry as you think about it? And as you continue to be in it, wh where are we headed? You think? I would just love to see the fitness profession valued a little mm. bit more in the healthcare system, exercise as medicine and recognizing the value of personal trainers and health coaches as critical to preventing patients from showing up in a provider's office. I, I did get into medical school. I didn't get the opportunity to go based on relocation with my yeah. husband's career. And when I take a step back today and I don't have a DR in front of my name, part of me is proud of that because I prevent people from seeing their doctor. Right. And while I could still do plenty of things in medicine, sure. you know, it's just like, we don't need the DR all the time. I didn't need the MD. It turns yeah. out I didn't need the MD after all. Yeah. And, and honestly, you know, in that version of being a doctor, it's very limited knowledge wise. You're very, you get a very tiny scope of understanding and often medical doctors just don't, they're not equipped to actually talk about exercise and nutrition and other components of wellness because you're, you're really tight roped into whatever specialty you're doing for yes. that. So it's not to say that it's not valuable. It's just that that needs innovation and it's educational <laughs> practice too. you know, doctors, medical doctors need innovation uh, because people listen to their doctors. 
I mean, what if your doctor does not have a sufficient education to actually tell you how to be better, which is the case for a majority of doctors? They just don't. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And when we see the specialization too, yeah. you know, they become very good at one specialty, not right. necessarily taking a step back to look at the patient as a whole person, yeah. which I think a lot of times as fitness professionals or health coaches, we're able to have a little bit wider lens, which yeah. is our superpower and should not be undervalued. Yeah. I think so. I think there's, um, there's a lot of good work being done out there in our profession. A lot of people who are really pushing for different legislation and really like, I mean, crazy meetings and stuff, <laughs> trying to get things done, passing the FIT Act and trying to get things like that done. I mean, I hope for the industry is that um, we will educate our upcoming pros much better. We'll think more outside the box mm -hmm. and then we'll be just much better at looking at the whole human instead of just the, the physical human side of health and wellness we really yeah. need to it's a it's one pillar of many that helps people to be well you know yeah. i would say it means nothing if you have a great nutritional approach you're extremely fit but you have really poor personal relationships and you have poor stress management i'm like what's the point <laughs> I'm like, yes let's put it yeah. we gotta start putting it together let's there's so many factors and pieces that are what it means to be well but I really want people like, let's discuss what does it mean to be well? And also, I hope that we keep progressing towards that, that mindset. And, and mentally, we focus on even more of that and socially and emotionally. Things that I think researchers in the past did not give a lot of credence to. But I see it more now, which I'm, I'm very happy to see that. So, Yeah, I think that the well-rounded fitness professional is yes. definitely a something to be explored and to be innovated and encouraged. And, yeah. you know, I did cre kind of create my own way in that and just yeah. earning over 15 different degrees and credentials. Yeah. But, you know, you, if you take a step back, you're like, there are so many working pieces to this yeah. and stress management. Like you said, it doesn't matter how healthy you eat. It doesn't matter how good you work out. If you're not sleeping and you're stressed, good luck seeing results. Good Sorry. luck. Good luck. <laughs> 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 like, yeah. Good luck Ooh. with that. Yeah. yeah. And we're or your results are going to come at the expense of your health, I which think, is going to yes. put you in a terrible place in a few months from now. Yeah. I often do this oh. when I, you know, train people, coach them, whatever. And I'm just like, tell me about your personal relationships. You know, are, are we on rocky footing here? Because honestly, I'm going to tell you, you've got to work on those. <laughs> like, yeah. you're not coming here just for fit, for, you know, the components, the metrics of fitness, the physical, like, we got to do something about these other things. Because if these are really rocky and you're crashing, I'm not sure what we're trying to accomplish here. <laughs> you know? Yeah. We can work you hard, you know? <laughs> yeah. I see the same thing with like boundary setting. Like if you don't have the support at home or you're not setting no. boundaries, like that example of the healthcare provider who's going, 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 mm -hmm. doesn't take the time for lunch and isn't, you know, air quotes allowed to take lunch. <laughs> like that's just not okay. It's not okay. Like I used to advocate for walk and talk meetings. I used to advocate like, I will come back a more innovative, you know, employee if yeah. I take a 10 minute walk outside right now, by the way, I have to do it for my health and I deserve oh. a lunch anyways. So I'd like, I mean, I just got to say that you just got to go. It's crazy <laughs> how much data we have that indicates how positive these things are, but we still have a pretty decent amount of corporations who will not apply this information to have more productive, happier, a happier workforce. It's like, you can keep denying this, but you know what people do now? They just jump jobs. They don't care if you're, if you feel no. this way, they're going to do something else. You, you know, it's inevitable. Treat people well. They will treat you well. <laughs> they, will, they will work hard for you, you know? Yeah. I don't know why this, this is very difficult to, is a, it's a shift. We're in a transition. It's a shift mentally from other things that have always been taught, you know, what the socialization, this learned socialization Versus what the data is saying was very clear. It's like not amb there's no ambiguity about it. Like yeah. people need breaks. <laughs> they need yeah. their mental health nourished. They need to move, be physically active, exercise regularly. We can't just keep people at work all day. Yeah. Uh, they're less productive. <laughs> like 
the more they sit at their desk, the more prone they are to chronic disease, the more your yeah. health insurance costs go up. Right. <laughs> it's a very simple obvious. equation. <laughs> yeah. It's not like this is like, oh, we came up with this really amazing, com complicated metric behind this. <laughs> yeah. So I, I always, I always just say, just stand up. Can you yeah. just stand up? Use yeah. the biggest, largest muscle legs or in, <laughs> muscles in your legs. It will shift the way your body processes food you're eating at your desk. Just stand up. Can you stand up? <laughs> Let's <Right>. start there. <laughs> Let's just stand up. Well, thank you for uh, spending some time with me today, Louise. Yeah, and, uh, I appreciate always a pleasure. it. Yeah, to meet another colleague. And even better that we're going to meet again in February uh, for yeah. ACSM Ideas collaboration based um, conference. So please tell everyone how they could learn more about you, get more information about you. Yeah, they can hop on over to breakingthroughwellness.com. That's my website. Uh, I have coaching services there, free master classes, guides, a blog, and then my brand new podcast, Maximizing Fitness, Fat Loss, and Running Through Perimenopause will be live on November 16th. So very thrilled for that. That's soon. That's coming yeah, up really it's soon. Coming. It's coming. <laughs> I know. Fantastic. Can't wait. Awesome. Another quality podcast from another quality person in our profession. We need more of that. So Thank you, Louise. Appreciate it. Yeah. Can't wait to meet everyone at IDEA and some ACSM Summit. <laughs>